I saw that Umbrella Guy's video about this article, and I want to throw in my two cents. The article is an interview of Border Town writer Eric Esquivel by Isabel Sofia Diepa. It's like reading thousands of words from the blissfully self-unaware. Neither of these two know what they're talking about, but they're pretty damn certain that they're right anyway. It's an amazing read. I'm not going to go through the whole article because I can only handle so much stupid and racism, and this is like a BLT of SJW fuckery with cheese. I'm not kidding. Here's the opening line. The opening line. Quote, Borders are imaginary boundaries that many modern politicians use to discern the humanity of a person. You have to have gone to college to say something that stupid. Borders are boundaries created to distinguish one independent state from another. That's it. This land is mine, that land is yours, and that land over there is open to whoever kills the natives first. That's it. No politicians are using borders to determine who's a person and who's not. That's your ridiculous spin because you can't handle that some people have this bizarre idea that they belong to a sovereign nation and want people to respect their laws. Jesus, this is the first line and we've already reached peak stupid. But wait, this is an interview. So when Isabel goes, none are as uninformed as me, Eric goes, hold my taco chica. He says, it's not just about the physical borders between US and Mexico. It's about the borders we put up between each other. These fake ideologies, like I'm left and you're right. These fake boundaries that are man-made concepts, and even things that we divide between like gender and stuff like that. It seems like a lot of folks are benefiting from drawing these imaginary lines between each other. You hypocritical mother. That's your entire book. The whole thing. Drawing lines between people, making one group inherently bad and everyone else inherently good. That's literally what you've done for three issues. Seriously, there's not a single good white person in your book. Not one. Every white person with a speaking role, just one word balloon, is racist. Here's a good example from the third issue. One of the girls, Amy, burns sage in her school and sets off the water sprinklers. The devil, I mean her straight white male vice principal, calls her into the office where he immediately, literally as soon as the door closes, starts macking on her. Seriously, look at the screen. One panel, he's chastising her. Next panel, there are easier ways to get my attention. This is how all white people are presented in Border Town. They're all scum. Now, so are the rest of the characters. Everyone in the book is a shitty person, with maybe the exception of Quinta. It's kind of like GTA. The difference, though, is that in GTA, no one is presented as the hero. They're all bad. Some are just less bad than others. In Border Town, the shitty people are made out to be heroes. They're virtuous not because of what they do or their actual character, but because of what groups they belong to. Now you can have people with questionable morals be your lead. Look at GTA. Look at Red Dead Redemption. But all those characters are shown as having some warped sense of morality because of their character. If you took all the lead characters in Border Town and made them white, they'd be the villains. That's how horrible they are. And those are the lines Eric drew all on his own. And those imaginary lines aren't limited to the book. Eric's Twitter feed reads like the ravings of a fanatic wrapped in identity politics lingo. So really just the ravings of a fanatic. He comes off as racist in his tweets, in his books, and in this interview. He also comes out as completely full of shit. He says about the infamous I'm Half Mexican panel, where resident conniving douche Julieta tells Frank, the main character, that he's Mexican and Irish and American, all 100% at the same time, quote, Every day, I get a tweet from someone that says they were teary-eyed reading that panel. Stop. Stop. You lying motherfucker. Stop. That never ever happened. Ever. Nowhere on the face of this planet, not even in your dreams, did that happen. This is shit you made up to feel better about yourself. Probably because you get hangups for being, wait for it, part Irish and Mexican. Oh, who didn't see that coming? Who didn't think Eric wrote himself as a hero of his own comic? You could feel it, couldn't you? You just knew, just knew that Eric, like most SJWs, had to really make this about himself. It's so shallow. So very shallow to do this. And it explains why Frank, who's a complete unlikable asshole, is presented as the good guy. If Frank is Eric, then this is Eric living out his power fantasy. Here's the thing. If you want to write an autobiography, just write an autobiography. Don't mix it in with fantasy and then try to pass it off as a horror story when 90% of the story is about you working out your biracial problems. Now, let's take a wild guess at why the white kids would be presented as villains. Just guess. You got it? Okay, so it turns out that Eric grew up in Arizona. 
He's in his 30s, so you can imagine that in the late 80s and early 90s Arizona, he was probably the odd one out, both being Mexican and biracial. So it shouldn't be surprising that Eric says, quote, I want to be one of the cool kids. No. Really? Who would have thought? He says, I had the opportunity now as a writer to sit down and create the book I wanted when I was a kid. Yeah, what kid didn't want to read a book about all the white kids who didn't like him, probably because he was a total asshole, being nothing but racist who deserved to be beaten and killed? Right? Am I right? We all wanted that. Imagine the reverse. Imagine if my one white high school teacher who grew up in a mostly black neighborhood wrote a comic where all the black characters were racist thugs. Imagine that. Who would even publish it? Imagine some guy who was abused by his mother writing a story where just one woman did something bad that couldn't be blamed on a man. Who would publish it? Imagine writing a story about bad Muslims. Hell, just saying that has probably gotten this video demonetized. The best part about this little stream of bullshit is when Eric says, The fact that the story isn't super after school special political. It's an adventure story with monsters and it takes place in an American Southwest on the border. I think that's what's making it pop. People don't want to be preached to, but they'll read an exciting adventure story. What book are you reading? You open the first issue with a bunch of rednecks trying to hunt down Mexicans crossing the border. That's your opening. Then throughout the issue you've got your Latinx characters preaching about ethnicity. This is literally 80% of your first issue. There's no exciting adventure, just an SJW writer preaching his bigoted nonsense to the handful of racists who actually like this book. He says that he didn't want to write stereotypes about Hispanic characters, but that's literally all he did. I'm wondering how well read this dude is because it's pretty hard to miss that he's relying on well used tropes. Everything seems to boil down to representation. Not thinking of any of the characters as individuals and building from there, but ticking off checkboxes to make sure we see Asian Latinos because we never get to see them in the media. How about starting with interesting characters? If the character you find turns out to be part Japanese and part Argentinian, fine. But just making them that to do that is lazy and uninventive. You're not letting the character grow, so all that will happen is that the character will have to fit inside the identity box you place them in. They won't be able to be more than their identity. And that doesn't mean you have to shun their identity. Kira Norris is Bajoran through and through, but once the writers on DS9 decide to let her be a character first, we got to see her grow and become interesting. She was still Bajoran and defined by her ties to her people, but she was more than one thing. I could go on and on about this, but that's not really what this article is about. It's about Eric trying to play the victim. Eric says, For this book, we had death threats. When it was announced that I was going to appear in San Diego Comic Con in a Vertigo panel, the tweets they were sending me were, We're not going to send ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. This time we're sending exterminators. Yeah, that's not a death threat. It's not nice, and whoever sent it shouldn't have sent it, but it's not really a death threat. If this is really all you got, it's not that bad. I'm sure what those white kids said was way worse to you in school, though not as bad as the shit you probably got from Mexicans for being mixed, because you know brown people are always so accepting to biracial people. Then Eric just lies. He says, The thing that hurt me the most is that there are a lot of people that tweet me and Facebook message me that don't know me, that are excited about the book, who go into their local store and sign up for a local subscription and try to order it, and the store refuses them. Bullshit. And I know it's bullshit for two reasons. One, if this had happened, it had been all over social media. No one is going to directly message you and only you to say that shops are refusing to carry the book. They'd have sent that to every comic book media outlet. It's even less believable that Eric would sit on that info instead of spilling it. It'd be the perfect virtue signal for fake comic book fans to rally behind a book they have no intention of actually reading. Two, that sounds suspiciously like an incident we actually have proof of where a handful of comic book store owners colluded in their super secret Legion of Doom Facebook group to refuse to carry or order Jawbreakers when Antarctic Press was going to publish it. They literally said they would refuse to order it if asked by customers. So it sounds like Eric here, hmm, <clears throat> appropriated Diversity in Comics' actual experience so he could play the victim. Are you sure your last name isn't Dolezal, Eric? Then he says, before it was sold out, they just didn't want to order it because of the content, because of the characters. That kills me. Why? You previewed the book by showing racist rednecks trying to kill Mexicans. What part of your brain made you think the predominantly white comic book audience would like your book? Seriously. Or how about this opening from your third issue? And I'm just going to read the text here. There was a time when this land was unspoiled by borders, fear, and hate. 
a time when beautiful bronze exemplars of human perfection lived proudly in massive golden cities that were so scientifically, artistically, and spiritually advanced, racist historians would rather believe they were designed by extraterrestrial intelligence than the native population. Right, so here's the thing. We're talking about the Aztecs. People who ritually sacrificed humans on such a scale that they may have killed up to 20,000 people a year. They would create these racks of skull that people actually thought the Spanish made up, but they were real and included hundreds of skulls, including ring towers of skulls placed in front of them. This is a civilization you're painting as, quote, beautiful bronze exemplars of human perfection. People who thought some imaginary friend needed the blood and still beating hearts of hundreds of captives in order to be satisfied. And this bullshit about people denying Aztecs built the pyramids and wanting to believe it was aliens instead? You know the ancient alien theorists say this about everything, right? They say the same thing about the pyramids in Egypt and European structures like Stonehenge. We can't explain how people built it, so it must be aliens. That's literally what they do every fucking time. Has nothing to do with race. Do you actually watch the show or are there too many white people on it for you? Then he says, quote, I want to believe that all comic book readers are trying to be Batman and are virtuous, cool people. But a lot of stores just didn't want Mexicans in it, and they didn't set up a subscription book for them. Bull shit. First of all, none of your characters outside of Quinta have a lick of virtue. These are people you wouldn't even leave your trash next to because you'd be afraid of what they'd do to it. Second, no shops have a problem with Mexicans buying comics from them. Stop with the race baiting bullshit. The reason people have a problem with your book is because the book is racist and demeaning. It trades on the most bigoted stereotypes about white people and Hispanics, treating white people in particular as irredeemable bigots. If any stores decided not to carry your book, chances are it's because they knew their customers wouldn't buy it and it'd be a waste of shelf space, not because they didn't want Mexicans in their stores. Now, let's get to this other lie you and Isabel kept touting this whole article. Quote, Not only did Border Town sell out, but it became Vertigo's first comic to go into reprint in five years, following in the footsteps of Neil Gaiman's Sandman Overture. Lies. Just so many lies in one sentence. Lies that don't even know that they're lies. Like they're Rachel from Blade Runner. How do they not know what they are? Okay, Isabel, Eric, let me ghetto explain this to you. Border Town didn't sell out. When you say something sold out, people think you mean it sold out of stores. That didn't happen. You can find first printings of Border Town at plenty of shops. What actually happened is that the publisher, DC Comics, sold all the copies it printed to the comic book shops. That's what sold out means. Not that customers actually bought all the books, but that the comic book retailers ordered the complete print run. All 15,000 units. Yeah, that's what you're bragging about. That's the typical print run for a heavily pushed indie book, and I'm willing to bet that DC overprinted and overshipped the book. So then we get to the reprints, and what's this? Only 1,500 units. That's your second print run. A tenth of the original, which again, probably is still sitting on shelves. And look, issue 2 already dropped the usual 41% down to 8,900. Basically, you've hit cancellation numbers in a month. Just one month, with a book that's supposed to be tamale hot. The truth is that the only people really interested in this book are leftist identitarians. No one else wants anything to do with this racist nonsense. The weird part is that if you remove the race baiting nonsense, there's actually a good monster story waiting to be told. Eric just can't see it because he's blinded by his need to sort out his racial hangups in this weird power fantasy. The other thing is that he probably doesn't want to write a comic book. He says in the article, quote, I want to create characters that live on after me, and I want to create properties that become adapted into TV shows and movies, so we get more Latinx actors and directors and writers and set dressers a job. So why don't you just write a TV show, dude? Television is super progressive right now, so short of your show being super expensive, you should have no problem pitching it to any of the woke studios out there. I mean, I'm sure Telemundo doesn't have the budget for this kind of show, but FX or Sci-Fi would snatch this right up. But I've got a feeling that the problem isn't that no one will take the show. I think the problem is that you're really not interested in entertaining people. You've just got some weird race-based hang-ups. Wherever would I get this idea? He says, quote, I wanted to be more colorful faces on things like DC's TV app that they just debuted. And the Justice League. Yeah, because two brown dudes and an Israeli woman and whatever the hell Ezra Miller is just isn't diverse enough. He says, I want to create a world where we're part of the conversation. Because as long as I've been alive, we've loved their stuff. I have Batman tattoos. And it wasn't until trying to work in the industry that I realized the things that I love don't always love me back. And that killed me. 
What the actual fuck are you talking about? When has Batman ever been racist? Ever. No part of the DC Universe shut you out. You shut yourself out by getting hung up on the character's race instead of their actual character. You're so worried about seeing people who look like you that you forgot that the whole point is to use your imagination. Learn about someone else. Learn from their lessons and struggles. Apply that to your own life. Every story isn't going to reflect your unique experience, Eric. And even though it's fair to say that you like to see non-white characters, it's not fair to say that because those characters aren't the most popular or prominent, that this is because everyone's racist or that characters like Batman are racist. Come on, dude. And yeah, that's probably wouldn't love you back because his character doesn't think racism is cool and you're practically brimming in ethnic hate. He'd batarang your ass and move on. But to come up with this nonsense that somehow the characters themselves are bad because they don't look like you? How fucking shallow are you, man? He says that he wants to show, quote, It's not only British guys in trench coats that work at Vertigo. Yeah, that's probably why his new Vertigo line sucks balls. But what do I know? I'm just some guy. 